Uh, hello again, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Coach Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Michael Pacheco, and today with me I have an encore presentation of Stan Peak. Um, Stan joined us, I don't remember when it was, it was over a year ago, I think. It, it must have been, it was a minute ago. Um, and, and this is his second time on the podcast, so we're going to just kind of catch up a little bit and talk about what's new in his world. Um, if you didn't have a chance to check out his first episode, definitely go back um, and check that out. Stan is a seven-time entrepreneur, a four-time best-selling author. Is it five-time now or five-time yet? Soon to Five-time now and hoping for six. There we go. Uh, Five-time best-selling author. I have an old bio from, from when we met before. Uh, and TEDx speaker on a mission to help one million leaders discover their potential. Stan, thank you uh, once again uh, for making time for me, and welcome uh, back to The Remarkable Coach. Pleasure's all mine, Michael. Thank you for having me back. Uh, I had a blast last time, and hope we can give a lot of value to the audience and just always enjoy chatting with you, so thank you. Awesome, man. Thank, thank you. Um, for those uh, of our listeners or, or, and viewers who have not had a chance to uh, listen or watch your first episode, why don't you just tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, who you are, what you do in your own words? Yeah, um, I'm a coach. I'm a, called a performance coach. I'm here to help driven entrepreneurs and executives reach their potential. Sounds like a Hallmark card, uh, but my backstory is I was at a place in my life uh, maybe 15 years ago where I was literally living 0% of my potential. Couldn't have gotten much lower. Yeah. Um, and so I've been hell-bent ever since, living on borrowed time. And I write, I speak, I coach, all from a purpose of trying to leave my corner of the world a little bit better than I found it. Um, yeah. I know what it's like to have the lights on but nobody home. I know what it's like to exist, not truly live, and certainly not thrive. And it sucks and it's painful. And uh, not every day is a great day, but I try to live every day with purpose. And I try to help other people live with more purpose and just make the most of the one shot at life they got. So that's what I do. It happens to be my job, but it's really a calling. Um, and I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a leader and that's who I understand. And that's who I live to serve. I love it, man. Um, in the bio, you're on a mission to help 1 million leaders discover their potential. That's a big calling, as you call it. Um, how, what's your plan? How, do you, how are you going to do that? Uh, the, what I love about that number is that it is big enough and it stretches me. When yeah. I started my coaching business in 2015, <laughs> the number was 100. At, at the time, I knew that a full-time practice for a coach is around 10 to 15 clients. And I thought, if I'm halfway good at it, I'm not going to have a big turnover. So I might have clients for a while. So I thought 100 is like a career. And I didn't take into account speaking engagements or writing books. But even just one-on-one -on -one coaching, before I knew it, I was there. Yeah. So then you start adding live events. And I go, well, let's, let's see if I can do 1,000. And then 10,000. Mm -hmm. And I just skipped over 100,000 because I, it was too linear. I could see where I would get there. A yeah. million, I didn't know how I was going to get there. Yep. And that's why I knew that was the right number. But the plan is to continue coaching as many people as I can uh, through our company, FSQ Consulting. We now have a team of 33 coaches. So that helps spread the impact uh, nice. in five countries. So I love it. We have coaches I haven't met in person, helping leaders I haven't met in person. Um, so while I'm sleeping, awesome things are happening. And uh, then writing the books helps me reach people that I wouldn't normally reach one-on-one -on -one as well. Mm -hmm. um, and God willing, I'll be able to do this for several more decades. And so um, although I'm living on borrowed time, I'm patient with how long it'll take me to reach that number. Nice. And I hope to add a zero, by the way. With yep. a big team, um, I hope I get that number and Ooh. say, well, I'm not done. Um, I think I'd be bored if I was retired. So I'm going to keep going for a while. I love it, man. I love it. So let's talk about your, your book. So again, the, the, the outdated bio that I have was a four, four time bestselling author. You're currently five times. So tell us about, tell us what's, what's new since the last time we talked. Clearly there's been a, a book that did well. 
Yeah, there's uh, so the last book that did well that we that uh, I don't know that we were discussing last time was called uh, Life Literacy. Um, and so if we didn't if that if we didn't chat about that, I'm trying to remember the exact timing. And the reason I'm not clear is because we launched that book right in the middle of the pandemic. And we all know nobody can tell time from 2020 to 2022. So uh, my memory is a little short on that one too, but that one ended up being a bestseller um, in Canada and the United States on Amazon, specifically around uh, career development and leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, that book was written because uh, my business partner and I both exited our companies um, at an opportune time, but also because it was no more fun. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of young people who were amazing hardworking, had the values, got the vision, and we're all over it. But we had a greater number of people um, who, yeah, they just weren't really there for it. Um, okay. And this is not a chastise of millennials or Gen Z or any of that. Mm -hmm. But what happened was um, what worked for me wasn't working for the generation behind me. Mm -hmm. Taking full responsibility, I was no longer the right leader for them. And I thought, like, I'm way too old, way too young to feel this old. I know that's a Garth Brooks song. Um, but regardless, he felt the same way. We started reaching out to our network of entrepreneurs and executives, and we realized it was a much bigger trend. Mm -hmm. So we, we wrote that book because our philosophy is leadership is when you see something, uh, it's not leadership to sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Sure. So we wanted to contribute. We wrote a book to millennials about how they can get ahead and how they can stand out in the crowd mm -hmm. instead of continually being labeled with that entitled, uh, you know, label. Mm -hmm. We also wanted to write a book for our generation and older with, hey, a lot of millennials are harder working than some Gen Xers and bring new and innovative ideas. You mm -hmm. need them. They're mm -hmm. going to have to run the company someday. Might as well start mentoring them. Nice. So we were thrilled that book did well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the one that went bestseller since. Um, lots more updates, but uh, uh, happy to pause for questions or if you want me to keep going, I'll keep going. Well, one thing I, one thing I do want to say is that I appreciate that you did mention Gen X because in all of this, in all of this conversation in the past, you know, let's say six years, about maybe a decade, um, you know, between millennials and boomers and Gen Z, it seems like Gen X, it seems like people just forgot about us. They did. And we have a very important role. Yeah. Uh, Gen Xers are going as a generation. The, the call to action for Gen Xers is to be the bridge builders mm -hmm. between the baby boomers who are exiting the workforce mm -hmm. and the millennials who are much larger uh, population demographic than we yeah. are who are going to hold all the keys. In fact, uh, the, the research that's a few years old estimated that by this year, by 2023, 75% of the workforce is millennials or younger. Mm -hmm. So it's naive to think that we can't mentor, train, and invest in millennials. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the baby boomers aren't going to, then Gen Xers have to. Mm -hmm. and let's face it, too. There's, there's, base, there's millennials that I think are now 40 or at least getting close to 40. So mm -hmm. when we say millennial, we're not talking about someone in their 20s. We're talking about now people that are experienced and mm -hmm. ready for leadership positions. For sure. For sure. Yeah, nice. Um, awesome. So what about, uh, well, just go, go ahead and keep going. What else is, what else is new in, in your world? Well, so the new, the new thing is uh, since we last chatted, um, I, I think we were maybe talking about, um, I had my own coaching company and we huh. had a, a, a collective that I had uh, become part of. Um, since that time, my coaching company is completely now absorbed by the collective consulting company, which is called FSQ. Uh, huh. F status quo is what it stands for. Um, <laughs> people can draw their own conclusions of whether it's forget or the other word. I, I love it. <laughs> um, but we just feel that uh, convention doing the same thing we've always done is going to give us the results we've already gotten. I know that sounds cliche, but leadership is an example. And that brings up the next book. Leadership is something that we uh, understand, but don't. Everybody knows leadership when they see it, mm -hmm. but there's not one universal definition. Mm -hmm. 
if we expand on that, and that's not new to anybody, we if we don't fully understand leadership from a, a universal definition, then we certainly don't know how to teach it in a universal fashion. Hmm. So what we do is we take a skill set that is complex, layered, and rooted in interpersonal skills, but we teach it in an academic setting. Mm -hmm. Let's go read a book about emotional intelligence. Let's take a course on communication mm -hmm. as opposed to learning those in a person-to-person -person or many people dynamic. Sure. Give me an example too. We were facilitating with clients uh, several months ago and we were doing a, a leadership offsite. Uh, it, it was in Las Vegas and we were talking about listening. Now, mm -hmm. listening is something, how many how many coaches know what active listening is? I hope all of them. And we can talk about listening with your whole body, but those are concepts we read about. Mm -hmm. That's not how you become a great listener. Sure. So to teach that skill, I'm giving an example here about shifting from reading about leadership to living it. Uh, we took a group of 26 leaders in one room. We turned up, uh, you know, background noise and music. And we tried to give them the most profound question we could. Partnered people up, but 13 pairs of people were all in the same room. Mm -hmm. And we asked them to have this intimate conversation about each other's purpose uh -huh. at the top of their lungs, as loud as they could. <laughs> so now you got 13 conversations happening, and I won't yell. I got a loud enough voice. But the cool thing about it is you can talk about a skill, but then you get into experiential learning. And everybody got it. And we had the debrief and it's like, how hard was that? And it was so cool that all these people who just heard about active listening huh? were saying, I didn't even hear that background noise. Really? They were, yeah, they were able to be fully present, be right there and develop a skill that is essential to leadership and coaching for that matter. I am <clears throat> personally fascinated by that. And I want to, and I want to know more. Um, I am, I am, I am diagnosed ADD. Um, and if, if there's, you know, if there's any background noise, I can't focus on anything. It's, it's, it's nary impossible for me. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, like, like what's, can you, can you, I know obviously we can't um, replicate that uh, environment here, but can you talk a little bit about what sort of, maybe on like a tactical level, what, what is active listening? How can you, how can you, how can someone focus on something like that with so much going on in the background? Great question. And it requires, pra requires intention, focus, and practice. Yeah. So focus, the example I always give is, let's say you bought a new outfit or you bought a new vehicle. The vehicle one is, is great, but people don't buy new vehicles that often. Um, when you buy a new vehicle, let's say you bought a, a Ford all of a sudden you see all the Fords on the road. Sure. The proportion of Fords on the road didn't change, but what happened was your awareness of Fords did. Yep. And you were able then to pick out, wow, there's a lot of Fords on the road. You didn't, it wasn't even on your radar before that. Mm -hmm. So bringing something to attention is one way we have a greater chance of having a hand on the steering wheel in keeping with that analogy in mm -hmm. terms of our conscious mind versus our subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the research shows us that we have over 5,000 thoughts a day, mm -hmm. and we have very little control of those thoughts at the initiation. Sure. Where the control comes in is when we are aware of the thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, we might say it's a shitty day. That's a thought that could pop up because of the weather, because of our first meeting, whatever. Yeah. But we have a choice as to whether or not we adopt that thought, whether we decide to believe that thought. Mm -hmm. So bringing awareness to our thoughts is the first thing uh, in the context of listening, being aware that we're distracted is the first step to becoming undistracted because we can reroute our focus back to the individual who's right in front of us. Mm -hmm. Now there's other tactical things we can do. Phone is off. Laptop is closed. If it's a meeting over zoom, no yeah. other browsers open. There's lots of tactical things we can do to decrease the likelihood of distraction and then if we've trained our brain, then we can become refocused much sooner with practice and with intention. Can anybody do this? Because I'm, I'm, 
I'm not convinced that I can do this, man. Like, honestly, I'll be, like, sitting on the couch with my laptop writing an email. And if my, my daughter, we just we were chatting before we hit record, I've got a, a one-year-old daughter now, and if she's playing with toys or, you know, banging something or just making noise in general, I, I will space out and I can't focus on what's directly in front of me. There, it's Im well, impossible. There, there's always caveats. I mean, especially a one-year-old daughter, there's that there's that, is she in trouble? Is she in imminent danger? I mean, let's face it. I mean, I, I've got a now 14 year old, but uh, when they're young, like toddlers or just before that, as parents, we gotta be actually aware of the threat of danger. Sure. So so there are uh, actual, um, I wanna say actual, because there's always perceived, you know, uh, a lot of people will say, but I'm different. And, and that might also be the case. There is clinical diagnosis when it comes to how people learn Mm -hmm. um, and their ability to focus. So I'm not saying that there's a, you know, silver bullet solution for all. Uh -huh. But what I am saying is that anybody and everybody can become more aware of their thoughts uh -huh. and they can put intention into whether they decide to focus on a thought uh -huh. or not. They uh -huh. can still be distracted, but it's like anything. Uh, it's like, no different than going to the gym. Yeah. Um, if everybody worked out, would we all look like Arnold Schwarzenegger? Of course not. Yeah. But could everybody get stronger? Yes. Okay. So Attract. as long as we, yeah, as long as we baseline our expectations, um, maybe, uh, maybe someone's highly creative mm -hmm. and someone who's highly creative, um, if they are, are trying to force themselves to be highly productive, they might be setting themselves up for failure. Uh, Einstein had a famous quote, everybody's a genius, but if we judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll spend its whole life thinking it's stupid. Yeah. So I also would add self-awareness. If uh -huh. we become aware of our gifts and our gaps, then we can actually, uh, it helps in our search for our passion, our calling, and, and the kind of careers or endeavors we take on. Mm-hmm. I see the guitar behind you um, and, and, you know, the whole setup. Uh, that's something that if you gave me Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours, uh -huh. see you in 10,000 hours, I'm still going to be terrible. <laughs> and singing, even worse. Uh -huh. I'm not kidding. I have video evidence that I will never share with anyone. My wife would happily would. Uh, we were in Philadelphia. We're at a, a karaoke bar. I sound like uh, Frankenstein singing. Maybe even Frankenstein after he's had a few and he decides to project his voice louder. It's so, for, so for our listeners and viewers, I will be getting in touch with Stan's wife after this and getting that footage. We'll put it on the show notes. Oh, man. It's uh, yeah. The, you know, those things that come back to haunt you. If I ever make it big sometime, uh -huh. that's that is the clip that'll be heard around the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, ever... but again, it goes back to set yourself up for success. Right. Yeah. Um, we that's the great thing about just life is that we can have different goals uh you and i clearly have a lot in common a lot of shared interests but we also have things that we don't necessarily share in common that's the beautiful thing that's why i love talking to you uh i have the ability to learn from you learn with you um and then we've got this zone of stuff that we have shared interests and, and common knowledge sure sure yeah it's the the, the venn diagram yeah um, awesome. Awesome. So I think, I think I cut you off. You were talking about, uh, Vegas and active listening. And then I wanted to know more about that, but you were, you were telling us, uh, all of the other new things that are, that are also new since we last spoke. Well, that, uh, springboards, I mean, that was a great working with a fantastic client, just, just thrilled working with them, uh, working with their team as well. Uh, a team of our coaches working with their leaders. Um, but that really began the, the curiosity and the research for the next book, uh, mm -hmm. the next book working title, fixing leadership. Um, we'll talk about when this episode comes out, but the book will be out, uh, towards the end of this year, 2023. Um, and we started doing a ton of research because, we noticed the gap. We talked about what leadership is, how it's taught. There's, a, there's one gap. The other gap is when leadership is taught, uh, are we teaching the relevant skills? Mm -hmm. Have we caught up to what leadership is today? Because we remember like 1982, the leader was the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. And if we're being real, the, the, the not the right thing, but the standard practice was the leader was the smartest guy in the room. That was what was most common. Mm -hmm. 
Today, the role of the leader has changed. Uh, mm -hmm. Number one, we expect leaders to be able to make uh, critical decisions with less information. We expect leaders to do a great job of uh, prioritizing and balancing both tactical strategy as well as cultural ideology. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of which, the left and right hemispheres of the brain, um, blood flow circulates back and forth better in the female brain. And so there's some neuroscience to back up that women make better values-based leaders, which I find fascinating. Um, but today, someone who gets hired today has different expectations of their boss, from middle management all the way up to CEO. Mm -hmm. Where I'm going with this is, before it was, how do I do my job, leave me alone? As Gen Xers and as baby boomers, we wanted to be left alone by our boss. When you, when you say before, you're talking 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, yes, but I'm also talking generationally. There's a difference in generations between the expected level of interaction with their direct supervisor. Gotcha, so sure. uh, boomers, uh, they wanted to see their boss as little as possible. Tell me what I need to do. Leave me alone. Unless I screw up, then I expect to be scolded. Yeah. Uh, us Gen Xers, a little more, maybe once a week, uh, once every two weeks. I'd like to get some uh, feedback once in a while. Not just if I screw up, I want to know if I'm doing a good job. Maybe a little bit of coaching. Mm -hmm. the, the research on millennials is, and this is old research, maybe it's changed a little bit, but they wanted to interact with their boss seven times a day. A wow. day. Now, that doesn't mean seven one-on-one -on -one meetings a day. Maybe that's some more social interaction. They wanted to get to know their boss a little better. Uh -huh. They also wanted more on-the-job coaching. Uh -huh. They literally want coaching from their boss. Now, that's not a bad thing until we realize that the baby boomers who are uh, retiring now uh -huh. through their whole career have received less than two weeks of leadership development total combined. <laughs> And if that's what the experienced generation is getting, it's not that hard of a mental leap to realize the less experienced generation has received less training. Sure. Now, remember, the role of the leader has changed. If we're doing barely any leadership development training, how much training are leaders getting today to actually learn how to be coaches? Mm -hmm. It's a nice round number, goose egg. Mm -hmm. So the, the, all this all says how we're teaching leadership development we're trying to take a, a front row seat in changing how we do leadership development. And the next book is all about tackling that, teaching leaders how to be coaches. We've mm -hmm. identified 15 key skills, listening obviously being one of them. We've already discussed on what leaders can do without having to be a certified coach to meet their team where they're at and develop uh, a coaching approach to leadership. So that to me is a bit of a legacy piece that I'm hoping like, yes, I'll write more books, but yeah. This is one I'm proud of, and I'm really hoping to make a dent uh, to help more leaders be more successful and help their teams thrive more. This is this is book number six, right? This is book number eight. Number so, eight. So uh, candidly, I do have two books that uh, performed abysmally um, on launch. That's good. No, if you if every single one of your books uh, was a bestseller, um, I, I I would be upset with you because I I, ha I don't have any bestsellers. <laughs> Well, that's how we learn anything. Um, I've spoken in front of a lot of people on big stages before, but I also gave a free talk downtown Calgary to three people once. Uh -huh. I, I, like anything, when you try something new, don't expect to be great at it right out of the gates. No. Awesome. So with this, so book number eight then, um, are you, so this book is going to be focused on on all of that, the, the, the teaching leaders to take a coaching based approach to leadership. Are you going to, is that, is this going to be kind of a how to, is this going to be more of a philosophical type of book? Are you going to have the 15 different tactics in there and how to implement those? What's the scope of the book? It's, it's research meets inspiration meets how to. So the research is, uh, we did a study, with uh, 180 uh, executives or leaders mm -hmm. in 26 countries. Mm -hmm. We asked them what they weren't prepared for when they started leading others. So mm -hmm. we wanted to expose what are the gaps today? What are people not being prepared for? That's the research part. Then I interviewed 10 of the best leaders I could find in business, sports, politics, religion, 
uh, philanthropy. I wanted to cover a few different bases. Um, and th their their advice, their wisdom is, oh, I can't wait for people to read it. Mm -hmm. So you've got this kind of inspiration piece combined with the research to expose the gaps. Then you've got the lived experience. Uh, and it's not just me, it's our coaches who have put together this wisdom, mm -hmm. which really is, what should we be teaching people? And that's where it comes down to, if this is the gap and this is where we want to go, here's 15 skills that can help you get there breaking down each skill, how to learn it, how to apply it. Um, and then uh, at the end is a bit of a call to action because reading about leadership doesn't make you a great leader. Um, I specifically call out, if you're a leader, here's what you can do. If you're in HR, here's what you can do. If you're a business owner, here's what you can do. Um, I'm that guy. I don't want someone to listen to me speak and then go back to what they were doing. I want someone who's heard me speak to do something different as a result of listening to me. I love that. I love that, man. I've, I've lost track of how many business books I've read and not implemented. And, you know, I mean, I've only got myself to blame for that, but I can imagine, I can imagine how easier it would have been, um, you know, if, if only through motivation and inspiration, if there was specifically like a call to action at the end of the book, it's like, okay, so you've read all this stuff. You, you, you know, my thoughts on it. You've got kind of my paradigm now. Go and make it happen. Here's what you can, here's what you can do based on where you're at in, you know, in, in, a, in a corporate hierarchy or something, in a business hierarchy. I think that's yeah, great. Stage of career, stage of life, right? Um, and, and that's the great thing about leadership is no one knows it all. Uh, one of the books that inspire, one, there's a lot. I do a lot of research before I write anything. Uh, I don't care how much you know, there's always more to learn. Mm -hmm. And I take that directly from John Maxwell. Um, I remember reading Leadership, uh, one of his books that's more recent. I think it was 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, Maxwell's in his 70s. So mm -hmm. he's amassed a lot of knowledge, written a lot of books. And I still really was inspired by his preface that, um, yes, there's a lot of downloads here. But the more I learn about leadership, the more I realize I have to learn. If I write another book in five years, there's going to be more stuff to it. And, yeah. and so that to me, and uh, to anyone listening, I know there's a lot of coaches listen to your podcast and a lot of those coaches have been told uh, or have the thought themselves, they should write a book. Mm -hmm. And what gets in the way of writing the book, at least from my own experience is, well, shit, what book haven't, I, what book hasn't been written about leadership or coaching mm -hmm. or whatever? And the answer is none. It's all been written. Yeah. But the book hasn't been written with your stories, with your ideas, your philosophies, and no one is going to write the book. And they've never, it's, it's never been written with your message, right? And, yeah, and, and, exactly. and readers, readers and leaders, readers and leaders, that's what rhymes. Um, the, yeah. the people reading these books, right? The people uh, taking in this content, they're going to resonate with different things. And like exactly. you were saying, like, you know, your stories are going to be very specific to you. Your message is specific to you. Your voice is unique to you. And you're going to you know, in, you're going to inspire someone, you're going to resonate with a reader in a way that John Maxwell's not going to, perhaps, right? Because it's different. So. Yeah. Think about, like you mentioned, you've read a lot of books, I've read a lot of books, uh, we take a little something from all of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you're more inspired by John Maxwell, maybe you're more inspired by Marshall Goldsmith, or Tony Robbins, or whoever. Right. Mm -hmm. But and, and even if you and I read the same 30 or 50 books, we're still going to pull something different out of each of them. That's the yeah. beautiful thing about it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, man. That's a really great way to look at it. And, and I think that is, you know, I mean, I think this is also too like this could be a call to action. In fact, I'm making this a call to action right now for anyone yes. listening, for anyone listening who thinks like you've been thinking about wanting to write a book or maybe this is a call to action to myself because I'm a perfectionist and I'm waiting until I can write the perfect book. And I, I know as well as you know, as you're saying it, it's not going to happen. There's no such thing as the perfect book. Um, so if you think you've got a book in you, just, just, just start writing and, and get your stories in there. Use your voice. Don't, don't use AI to write the stupid book. <laughs> no. In fact, let's do this together. Uh, Let's make it a call to action. I love to share my process for writing books that's made it way easier for me. Um, I write them backwards. And so if you're thinking about writing a book and you've never done it before, I'm happy to give your audience a few steps. The first Please. step I always use is 
who is this book for? Get real clear on your intended audience. Who are they? Where are they? Not just geographically, but in their life. Is there a certain industry? Whatever. Get crystal clear on who your audience is. Mm -hmm. Now, the part of that is, if you know who your audience is, ask yourself the question, what do you want them to do as a result of reading your book? Mm -hmm. Not what do you want them to learn? What do you want them to do? Now, there's the self-serving side. Take your course, hire you as a coach, whatever. But sure. I'd like to think there's usually more of a bigger picture, a purpose, a mission to it. You want them to uh, implement different uh, healthy behaviors, or you want them to go after their dreams, or you want them to, uh, you know, become a better leader. There's an outcome you're hoping for. So if you know your audience and you know your outcome, then coaches can appreciate this. The precursor to action is emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big advocate for cognitive behavioral therapy, which is basically there's a trigger event, causes a thought, thoughts to beliefs, beliefs to emotions, emotions to action, and our actions dictate our results. Mm -hmm. So if you know what action you want your audience to take, then it's not that hard to reverse engineer what emotion you want them to feel mm -hmm. so that they'll most likely take that action. Mm -hmm. Well, now you know what the outcome is and you know how you want your audience to feel. Now all you got to figure out is how do I make them feel that through stories, through statistics, through case studies, and through storytelling. So you basically your book is how do I get my audience to feel that emotion? Mm -hmm. The last piece is how do you open and capture their attention quickly? And how do you close with a bang? And you and I just gave an idea for that a call to action, uh, an inspiring call to action. That's how we can end. If we can follow a process like that, your book writes itself. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you take all this information, we hope to, and we don't know where it's going. It's like, uh, I'm going to tell you what, you and I are going hiking together. I'm not telling you where we're going or how long we're going to be gone. What would you pack? You have no idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if we're clear on the destination, you start to know exactly how you're going to get there. Sure. The last piece I always ask a potential author to consider when writing a book is, what does this book do for you? Mm -hmm. Is this something you're trying to make money at? Is this a means to an end where you're trying to establish thought leadership and your credibility in your space? Uh, mm -hmm. Is this book lead gen that you hope to get more coaching clients or book more speaking gigs or sell your course? Be really clear on what this does for you, but I always do that second. I think about your audience first. Do the do the give and then think about your ask. And then you've got not only a way to write your book, but it also aligns with your overarching business strategy so that you don't get spread out doing a book here, a podcast there, and then going, oh my God, there's no hours left in the day and I'm not making enough money. It yeah. should be aligned. Yeah. I love it. That's great, man. That's awesome. I appreciate you you sharing that. I think that's fantastic. Um, can you talk briefly about the what what it looks like to reverse engineer that uh, you know using CBT to reverse cognitive behavioral therapy to reverse engineer from the results? You know, what do you want your what do you want your reader to do? What action do you want your reader to take? And then reverse engineer that to the emotion that you want them to feel. What does that look like? Yeah. So if we think, um, let, let's think about a specific action. So the book I've just written, um, and again, the working title is Fixing Leadership. The action I want uh, people to take, and let's use a specific audience. I want a decision maker in the corporation to, uh, let's say they're the VP of HR or talent and culture. I, I want this person to critically evaluate what they have in place in terms of their leadership development practices. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to hire us, but mm -hmm. if what they have is not up to snuff, I want them to rip it up and create something new. Fix it. So, right, I want them to fix it. So the action is evaluate and improve. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to do that, they have to have an emotion of conviction. Mm -hmm. They have to understand that right now they're losing leaders unnecessarily, and probably just as uh, unfortunate, they're keeping leaders who are ill-equipped to do the job. Mm -hmm. And that is that is holding people back in the organization. It's leading to turnover. Mm -hmm. So it's exposing that decision maker to that reality. You're bleeding cash unnecessarily. 
you're mm -hmm. losing good people unnecessarily mm -hmm. and you've got latent talent that's not developing to its potential all because you haven't cultivated great potential through great leadership in your organization mm -hmm. so the emotion i want people feeling pissed off uh, a little fearful not from a fear mongering but i want them to feel the problem mm -hmm. and how do i get them there as i mentioned statistics there's a lot of statistics um one statistic is right now organizations spend about 385 billion dollars a year on leadership development and True. through all of that approximately 11 percent of all organizations have leadership talent and succession that they need to achieve their goals in the next 10 years mm -hmm. if we're spending 400 billion we should be a lot closer to 80 to 90 percent of organizations having the talent they need mm -hmm. so there's a massive gap uh, another statistic is that for every year an organization puts off a proper leadership development program they can actually have their revenue decline by up to seven percent the very next year so like this it. is not a fixed expense there's actually roi built right in you're and using know that. You're, and you're using quantifiable data yes. in order to bring out emotion in these in the decision makers and in your readers that's exactly right over right. and above the case study research which uh, all research you could say is subjective uh well where's this study you know uh so so if someone wants to completely refute my research mm -hmm. no problem there's mm -hmm. still 32 uh references documented everything from forbes magazine to uh human resources documented research you name it yeah. Uh, it's all out there. Nice. Awesome. Well, that's, yeah, great. that's how we, that's how we'd reverse engineer. Uh, this it. is the emotion. Understand it. How do we get them there? Expose them to those statistics, help yeah. them understand the problem and what is, what that looks like in their organization. Yeah. I suspect, I mean, statistics on the back of stories, I just would, would, would be helpful as well, right? Because stories is like, you know, historically, uh, stories is what connects humans from, you know, the dawn of time. <laughs> That's your, your bang on. That's exactly right. It has to be both. It, yeah. it really has to be both. And I also, as I mentioned, interview some top level leaders. So as we talk about the research and talk about the skills, I mm -hmm. weave the stories of these leaders into that mm -hmm. so that we're always toggling back and forth between best practice, research and stories. Love it. That's great, man. That's awesome, Stan. I appreciate you taking the time to, to share some of that with us. Um, those are great tips. I'm going to be using those <laughs> myself. If no one else listening does, I will at least be using them for sure. Well, I love that it's a call to action. I remember Les Brown saying that uh, everybody has a book in them, but less than 1% of the population ever publishes it. Mm -hmm. So I hope that more of your listeners will take that call to action, take the pressure off themselves to write the, the next you know, amazing book. Um, if one person reads your book and changes their life, it's worth writing. So yeah, this is, yeah, this is great, man. And this is, this is, it's kind of funny too, because the, the podcast, uh, that is going to be released in the future, right before yours, before this podcast, uh, is with a woman named Honoré Quarter, who is, are you familiar with her? So she, she co-wrote oh, Bell. She co-wrote Miracle Morning with Hal Elrod, and she is a, a, a book, a writing coach, a book publishing coach. Um, so that'll be kind of a one-two punch two weeks in a row um, with some great, um, some great ideas and, and information on, on how to, to get your book done. So I think that's, that's kind of fun. Awesome. Sweet, man. Um, well, Stan, is there anything else? I want to be respectful of your time here. We've been going at it for about 45 minutes. Is there anything else that you want to chat about that we haven't had an opportunity to touch upon yet? Oh, I mean, we could chat forever, clearly. Uh, but just um, if there's, I, I, I'm really open to people messaging me on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Uh, my email is stan at getsuccessfaster.com. So if people want to explore these ideas further, feel free to reach out. Um, I, I love your platform. I love your podcast. I think you're awesome. And uh, just I'm here to serve. So if I can serve beyond our time together, I'm happy to do so. 
Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Um, and for our listeners and viewers, of course, we'll have uh, those links to uh, Stan's website, GetSuccessFaster.com, as well as his LinkedIn, uh, directly to his LinkedIn profile. We'll have those links on our podcast. I'll throw in some links in there, too, about some of the books we talked about. I know we talked about uh, Leadership with John Maxwell and, of course, your books. We'll get those on there as well. Um, so, yeah, man, I mean, this has been great. Thank you so much for, for making the time for me. Anytime. It's always a pleasure, brother. Time with you is well spent. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And thank you, as always, to our uh, viewers and listeners. You guys, uh, the podcast doesn't mean anything without you. So uh, always appreciate that. And we will see you guys next time. Take care. Right now I can figure out how to stop recording.